Welcome, welcome everyone to Be Real Talks. I'm Sophia Gibri. Today we are welcoming Dr. Calvin Gant. He is a Binghamton University alum and has over 20 years experience in higher education. In this field, he has taken on a variety of roles such as Counselor of Disability Services and Director of Access and Opportunity Programs. Currently, he is a Chief Diversity Officer. Kelvin describes himself as a servient leader who believes that relationships built on trust and mutual respect are the foundation for collaboration and service. He is also an advocate for mentorship and is particularly passionate about nurturing the development of first generation, low income, and underrepresented minority students. Today, we're going to be looking at representation in the workplace. Thank you so much for joining us, Kelvin. No problem. I'm glad for the opportunity. So just to kind of get us started here and we, so we can get to know more about you, can you let us know how your personal experience and identity really influenced your career path? Okay, well, um, as you mentioned, uh, I am a Binghamton. Well, at that time, it was SUNY Binghamton, so now Binghamton University uh, alum. Uh, and at the time when I came to Binghamton, I came through the Education Opportunity Program. Uh, so for me, uh, the program was a lifeline. Uh, I'm the only person in my family to have gone to college. Uh, and so having the opportunity through EOP to be able to make that a reality um, really was a was a life-changing thing for me. Uh, and to go away from home uh, for the first time and, and engage with being on a college campus, uh, you learn a lot. Uh, you learn a lot about yourself uh, and you learn a lot about the people that are around you. Uh, but even more importantly, strange, strangely to me, I learned a lot about what I didn't know. Um, I didn't know uh, at the time when I went away to school at Binghamton, for example, that I was poor. I, I didn't conceptually know that I was poor. Um, so that was a, a wake up call uh, when you're talking with kids who, who asked you questions like, where, when are you, where are you going for spring break and, and things of that nature? And, it just wasn't something that was a part of my lived experience. And so I grew up a lot um, through my experience at Binghamton and, and through the EOP program and got re received wonderful nurturing and, and mentoring uh, through that program. And although I thought in my career I was going to be headed to law school, uh, that was a what they call PPL or politics, philosophy, and law major uh, at Binghamton, and although I was interested in law school and applied to law school, um, really all of my experiences while I was a student there were kind of a combination of law and social work, uh, strangely enough. So I did quite a few internships and externship experiences that really gave me the perspective that, you know, maybe the, the counseling direction of things uh, was the way for me to go. I fought it. Uh, I fought it tooth and nail because I knew that it wasn't going to make me a lot of money. Uh, let's just be real about that. And because I did find out that I was poor after going to Binghamton, I wanted a job that was going to warrant me making more money. But at the end of the day, you know, when the opportunities presented themselves, it continued to come back to me that <clears throat> I had a skill set uh, in working with folks that looked like me, that had similar experiences to me, and that I could I could make a difference uh, in their lived experience. So that's kind of how I got on the trajectory uh, of doing work uh, in opportunity programs, uh, which I did for 20 years um, after I graduated. And, you know, now doing the work that I'm doing from a, at a much larger level from a college perspective as a chief diversity officer, I still know that that work is foundational to everything that I do. Uh, so that's very important uh, in knowing where I came from and, and what I still have to do and what it's going to take to make change. Those things all came through that experience and the knowledge that I gained there. And so I, I bring all of that to the work that I do now as a chief diversity officer. And I think it's, it's helped me uh, in building the relationships that I have at my current institution. 
Yeah, that's very full circle, right? You know, from your journey and how you were impacted and understanding your identity and who you were and then being able to kind of take on those leadership roles and kind of give back to students who are in those similar situations. Um, so thinking about, you know, you've been in so many leadership uh, positions, such as, you know, director, chief diversity officer, what are some of the benefits of people from historically underrepresented communities having that seat at the table? Well, I, I think, again, because you come with a variety of different perspectives uh, and experience, lived experiences uh, similar to the students that are, are going to be entering the institution, uh, not having a seat at that table, I think, of course, creates a void. It creates a void in understanding. It creates a void in terms of empathy. Uh, it creates a void in even knowing how to to build the programs necessary to not only attract the students, but to retain and graduate the students. Uh, so not having a seat at that table uh, really for most institutions leaves those institutions in a really, you know, really vulnerable place as it relates to, you know, the success of the students of color that may be coming through their uh, respective institutions. So. For me, that's one of the reasons why having a seat at the table is, is essential. Yeah, that um, equal representation or working our way to equal representation, for sure. And then building on that a little bit. So, you know, you've been in those rooms and you've been able to voice your opinions. But there is this notion of playing the game, right? Mm -hmm. So for those who are unfamiliar, it can be thought of as kind of abiding by the rules, kind of going to what is expected of you. Some people talk about it of, well, I just have to play the game. That's what I have to do to get out of poverty. And some people can kind of see it in a negative way. So what advice do you have for students that are resistant to playing the game or just working for a company that doesn't completely mirror their values? Right. Well, I mean, the, the, the playing of the game aspect of things, you know, is, is going to be, as you said, seen very differently depending on, you know, what that student's experience or background is. Uh, if they're a first generation college student and they have not had anyone, cousins, family members, uh, go to college, I think it's a, it's a very different, uh, kind of mindset, uh, than maybe someone who's, who's had a relative, uh, that's gone to school. Uh, I think they become into the institution a little bit more savvy. Uh, in terms of what they need to do uh, in order to get to where they want to go. Um, but I always found that it was partially my responsibility and obviously the counselors that work with the students, it was partially their responsibility to help connect the dots for the students, uh, to help them to move away from the mindset of it being a game, but understanding that this is the way systems work uh, and that you need to understand the system before you can change the system. Uh, and that's something that is very difficult if you've never been a part of a system. You don't know that there actually is a system to all of this. There's a system this. Uh, and those that have had the advantage of knowing people who've gone through that system have very little difficulty navigating it. Um, but if you have not gone through the system, it's a completely new world for you. Uh, so I try to help students understand that it's not necessarily about the playing of the game. It's about understanding how the systems that our society has created um, that either allow you in or in some cases keep you out uh, of higher education. Uh, and since you have that opportunity, since you were granted that opportunity through a variety of different means, what do you do with that opportunity? Uh, do you then take that opportunity and go back to your community and help people to understand what it takes to get into the system? Uh, because if you don't go back and do that, or people that look like you don't go back and do that, then the system wins. Uh, so again, it's talking with all of the students and helping them understand that they have a vested responsibility uh, in going back. I mean, that's the reason why programs like EOP continue to thrive and do as well as they do, uh, as we have so many alumni that are willing to go back and talk to students or, or mentor students uh, and remind them that, you know, I, I am where you were uh, and I am where I'm going, you know, I'm where I am now in terms of my job because I learned the system and then I learned how to appreciate my own worth and value as it relates to that system. 
because again, that's that's another learning curve uh, for you. And you mentioned about you know going to companies uh, that sometimes don't match your values. Uh, again, that's that's one of the things you have to be mindful of. You know, are you chasing the money? Or are you chasing the experience? Uh, if you're chasing the money, uh, then you are likely going to wind up in many situations in an environment that doesn't necessarily match your values. Uh, so you have to do some some thinking about what those values are before you sign on the dotted line for that particular industry. You know, so when you're interviewing, are you asking the appropriate questions about, you know, what opportunities are there for mentoring uh, for me as an employee, as an employee of color? Are there what they call employee um, reflection groups or response groups uh, within the, you know, within the company? Uh, If not, you know, is there an opportunity for those things to be created or developed? Uh, Again, so it depends on what it is you're looking for. Do you want to be a part of the institution? Are you willing to be the person that leads some of that change? And because of that initiative, you may open doors to opportunities uh, within the company that may otherwise not have been available to you. Uh, So just again, the same to people, you, you have to know and navigate for yourself. What do you want that experience to look like? Uh, No longer are we doing 20 and 30 years at a company anymore. Uh, but if you're going to invest in working for a company for two to five years, what is it at the end of the day that you, from a skill perspective, want to take away from that company that puts you in the best position to move on to the next thing it is that you want to do, either in your career or if you want to go out and start your own business? What is it that you need to develop uh, in yourself in order to be able to do that and do that effectively? Uh, so again, I think the way you couch it and the way you help them to understand it um, makes it or helps, I think, move from being a game to understanding that this is the way we navigate systems. Yeah, and there's so much to unpack there. You said a lot of really valuable things and that just emphasis on critical thinking. I think that sometimes students are so like fast paced, right? Got to get this degree, got to finish it in four years because there is that. I know I was one of those students, uh, admittedly, you know, that pressure to try to get out of poverty um, and you can't spend more money and more time in college. But if you really think about it, if you are reflective beforehand, it actually ends up saving you time, right, in the long run, because you can reflect, you understand what your values are, um, and then also manage your career appropriately, like you said. What is it money that's motivating me? Can I make changes in a place that doesn't completely represent my beliefs? Um, so super important. Mm-hmm. And, and be willing to walk away from that. You have to be willing to walk away from the money. If you if if it really compromises who you are and what your values are, you know, are you prepared to walk away from the money and go towards the experience uh, that's going to allow you at the end of the day to go home and feel good about what it is that you're doing? Um, because money is great, but you know, you don't you don't get to sleep with it. You don't get to you know you don't get to have conversations with it. You you don't get to help people in the community understand what you're trying to do uh, just with the money that that you make. Uh, you you have to do that through other avenues. So if you're able to build a foundation for yourself through other things uh, that allow you to continue to de- develop who you want to be, uh, that's different. Um, but if you're trying to put all of those eggs in one basket through the company. Uh, I've, I find that there are very, very few companies in the world uh, that actually can fulfill that much of anyone's needs. Yeah, for sure. And what would you say to students that are trying to advocate for um, diversity, equity, and inclusion? What are some tips you have, whether it be for the workplace or on campus? Well, probably the biggest thing that I would say to them, and, and it's been it's been true throughout my whole career. Uh, no matter where you work, no matter where you go, want to, where you go to school, everyone wants to be the best. Okay, every company, every institution wants to be on someone's list as the best. Okay, knowing that going into whatever company or institution that you might work for, you have to figure out what aspects of diversity helps that institution or company 
become the best? What research can you do about those specific things that helps the company see, you know, when you go to, you have that opportunity to talk with your boss and you can say, well, I know some of our peer companies or our peer institutions are doing X, Y, and Z as it relates to diversity and they're experiencing higher retention graduation rates, which then allow them to apply for federal and state grants that we as an institution aren't. Uh, so, bringing that information forward sometimes to the institution gives them a very different perspective about what's in it for them. But what you're actually doing is creating a a more welcoming environment uh, for the students, you know, that your institution or company serves. Uh, So you have to be willing to do that research and come to them with those things that are important to them. You got to know what the mission is, what the goals are of the company, what do they value and what's important. What does that mission statement say? And repeat that to them in your responses and your answers as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm sure that people at my institution sometimes get tired of hearing me quote uh, our mission, uh, but I remind them of that because equity, diversity, and inclusion is listed in our mission. And so if we're not doing, if our decision making is not inclusive, of those three categories, then we're not making decisions that are best for all students that we serve. Uh, and, and that's my job that, you know, I am to repeat and keep reminding people of that, uh, because it's an important aspect of, of what we do. We are a community college in the middle of that is community. So if we're not respecting or representing the community that we serve, at some point we become antiquated and not a place that people respect. Uh, and so we always want to be, as I said, we always want to be first. We always want to be respected. And so you have to continue to remind people that part of that means that you have to be paying attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and I think that if you're doing that and finding ways to be able to make those inroads, um, even when you find resistance, because there's going to there's going to be resistance, uh, because the perception is that it's always going to cost you a lot more money. Uh, but sometimes you have to put money into what it is you're trying to do to recognize that at the end, because we invested this much up front, we were able to actually go out and apply for other monies that pretty much wiped out what we spent up front. Uh, and again, so how do you how do you lay that plan out? So I even say to students, as you're going through your different majors uh, and you have opportunities and they say, pick whatever topic or subject uh, you want to do your research on, be thinking about where you want to go and use those as opportunities to gather information and knowledge that you otherwise would not have access to. Uh, that's going to serve you well when you go to interview. That's going to serve you well uh, for any job that you do. Uh, and the fact that you can even show that you not only are interested in it, but you've actually done research on it and be able to demonstrate that to any agency is going to put you in a good place. So, That's a very strategic approach there um, and holding the account um, people accountable, right? Uh, I feel like mission statements and visions are the kind of thing people write it and they just never look back to it. Right. Uh, Which is very problematic because there's so much built into those statements that we should be following uh, so I like that constant reminder there of, no, this is what we should be focused on and for students to be aware that it's perfectly fine for them to do that in the workplace. Because right. otherwise, truly, from a student standpoint, then we have sold you something and told you that if you come to our institution, this is the product that you can expect as a participant in our institution. And if we're not delivering on that, then we have sold students a a, a false sense of what they should expect from our institution. And so that's on us. You know, that's on those people that are in administration like myself now uh, to be paying attention to that. Because, you know, again, your word is supposed to be your bond. You know, your mission is supposed to be at the end of the day what what people get out of it. And if that's not happening then we need to re- we need to revisit it and come up with a mission that we actually can can abide by 
Mm -hmm. And kind of speaking on the side of if these um, initiatives aren't happening, what are some of the obstacles that you've seen, whether it be as a chief diversity officer or any role that you've had really um, when it comes to hiring and retaining qualified candidates from marginalized communities? Well, I would say, you know, from my end, one of the biggest and, and most significant drawbacks uh, is the fact that most of the companies or institutions have a very small um, minority faculty and staff population to begin with. And so one of the things that we know through from research is that, and we talked about it with EOP, that mentoring piece is extremely important. So if there are no opportunities within the company to have a mentor and the company is not meeting your values, then you're not likely to want to stay with that company because what, what is the what is the value added for you of participating in that company? Uh, so, <clears throat> from my end, that's one of the the biggest things is because you don't have the numbers to be able to provide new employees with that that sense of community when they come with it to your institution or to the company then it's much more difficult to retain them because that, that's what they're looking for. Uh, they're looking for people who have a common experience or a shared experience uh, than that they do. Uh, and they're not willing, they're willing to come to a company that doesn't have that initially. Most people are willing to come to a company that doesn't have that initially, but after a certain period of time, you know, Words matter and actions matter. So if you haven't moved the needle and, you know, you came and you were one of two and five years later, you're still one of two, uh, you see that diversity may not be the most, is not the highest priority maybe for that particular company. Uh, and so then you have to start questioning and asking yourself, is it worth it for me to stay here or do I go towards a company that through research is actually demonstrating through their activities and actions that diversity is important to them. Uh, and so that's, that's one of the biggest uh, hurdles I think is that the second big one is when you have the companies and, and so many companies now are hiring diversity, equity and inclusion officers. So outside of just education, many corporations now are hiring diversity, equity and inclusion officers, but many of them don't have a budget or they have a minuscule, a very, very small budget. Well, to move the needle on things that are as systematic as racism in higher education or in the, in the workforce, you know, a 10000 or $30,000 budget, that's, that's really not going to be able to do a whole lot in terms of, you know, bringing in speakers, you know, creating opportunities for development for not only your employees of color, but certainly the, the non-employees of color to help them understand uh, why diversity, equity, and inclusion is, is important. Um, what's the message coming from the top? Uh, and is that message being followed up by action? Uh, again, is it being followed up by with resources? If those things don't fall in line with each other, you know, it's a it's a two year, maybe three year span of time that you see diversity officers staying in certain roles and within certain organizations or institutions uh, because they're seeing that that commitment is not is not growing. And it's very difficult to do this kind of work, you know, if you don't even have the financial support and means to be able to bring in some of the prominent leaders in, in thought provoking conversations that you need to have within the company. So that's important. So I would guess that some of your solutions would be putting more money um, into these kind of initiatives for sure, having more representation so that people feel comfortable in the space, right? And it's not that people aren't able to get along with others outside of those who can understand, but it's just there should be people that do understand too, right? Um, so that's just as important. Um, but kind of looking at so from your perspective, how can you really build um, diversity, equity, inclusion, equal representation into a workplace organization or institution? Well, I wish I could tell you I had the magic, the magic bullet for that. If so, I would be a really rich person. Uh, you'd be interviewing me from some island uh, off in the Caribbean somewhere. Uh, so I wish I had a, a quick answer uh, to that. 
uh, again, I would say to you is probably more to do with stick to itness. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a lot of frustration, uh, that comes along with trying to build up, uh, these, these types of programs and these types of initiatives, uh, because you feel like you're constantly upstream, swimming upstream, trying to, you know, this person who was in leadership leaves, you bring a new person in, you have to basically retrain them on what diversity, equity, and inclusion is. So you feel like, you know, you're constantly having uh, to stay in training mode. Uh, and at some point in time, you start to say, you know, we have to move beyond training uh, and actually move into solutions and, and action steps. Uh, so, you know, for an important thing, I think, would be if institutions instituted an, an equity scorecard. You know, what does that look like? Uh, so set some metrics, set some very specific metrics uh, for the institution or for the corporation. We anticipate by this year we're going to have this percentage of folks of these different backgrounds. And then measure yourself against those numbers and look at what you're doing. Again, that's going to require some resources. If you want to go out and recruit people from companies to come work for you, you actually have to travel sometimes. You actually have to put your ads in, in places that are going to cost money uh, to be able to do that. Those things all are, are costly. Uh, so you got to make the commitment uh, to being able to do that. Um, but again, you, you also have to have a wonderful network. Um, thank goodness for me, you know, we have... For SUNY, we have all of the chief diversity officers. Uh, for Western New York, I am the co-president for our Western New York diversity officers group. Uh, so you have to have uh, those people that you can bounce ideas off of <clears throat> and those people you can call and complain about when you f you're feeling at your low point. Uh, you have to have people that you can do that with who recognize and understand what you're going through uh, so that you can then return back and do the work that you know needs to be done. Uh, and so I, I have that. And there's tons of, you know, diversity people that are doing really, really fantastic things, you know, in the country and, and abroad and being able to tap into those. And I think a big piece of it, too, is n not forcing yourself to reinvent wheels that are out there, too. So do the research. There are some places that are doing things exactly that you are wanting to do uh, within your agency or company. It's just a matter of shifting some of what they do to fit the fit the institution or the company. Uh, so don't go out and reinvent a wheel that already exists. It's like, wait, this company is doing that really well. They don't exactly fit the model for our institution, but there are plenty of pieces of what they do that we can translate into what we do and create that same kind of culture for us. Uh, so those would be some of the things that I would say you know, needs to, to happen. Uh, certainly from an institutional standpoint, we have, you know, what the curriculum looks like. You know, how invested are we in our curriculum <clears throat> being reflective of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Uh, I know the argument because I hear it all the time. You know, there'll be certain majors and areas of study that would say, well, we can't incorporate it into our department because it doesn't exist. Well, I tell you nine times out of 10, it exists. Um, they just haven't done the research to find out what exists. Uh, and I try to remind people all the time, you don't have to always be the person that creates the knowledge. You can assign it as an assignment, a homework assignment for students to go out and look specifically for companies or agencies or whatever that do diversity as it relates to biology, chemistry, physics. Da -da. I said, so it, it's not always that the instructor has to be the physical lead, but they can encourage the development and the thinking by instructing or asking students to go out and bring some of that information back. Uh, so that's how we train our students to become more thoughtful in their own development as they prepare themselves to go out, you know, into the workforce. So, again, to be mindful of the fact that, you know, you don't have to be the person that creates everything. I think for me, some of the, the value in the work that I do is the collaborations that I'm able to have across campus with faculty and staff to do the work that I do. There's no way one individual, you know, can move an entire campus and change an entire culture 
uh, for an institution. That's, that's an impossibility uh, for one person to do. Um, but when you are able to build those relationships that we've been talking about, you find who those allies are uh, and you build those bridges across uh, divisions and across units and you figure out ways to be able to make opportunities available for more people, more students, um, both at the institution and within your company. So that's how I would say you have to kind of structure yourself uh, to keep doing the work. Yeah, so many great insights there. But that last one about collaboration is really, really important because a lot of the times people I feel in workspaces can be a little competitive. Um, but really what I've seen is just collaborative efforts, people working around their strengths can be so, so beneficial to the entire organization. My, so I really want to end on a high note here. Uh, what is your proudest achievement in your role? Wow. My proudest achievement thus far in my role. Hmm. Well, I, I have two, so I have to now choose. I have to choose between the two that I want to. Um, if they're both turn. equally as great, you could share them. Well, I started my job. I'll, I'll use. I'll try to get both in really quickly. I started my job uh, at Monroe Community College in August of 2018, and when I started, <laughs> within the first week. First week. So I started on a Monday, that Friday. Uh, I was told that the college was going through a reorganization and that I was, I had no staff when I started and that I was going to get pick up Title IX and uh, all of the multicultural services office. Uh, so that was an interesting first week to, to, to be told that you're picking up new assignments. Uh, so that was, that was interesting, but I was also told that uh, the college had already been thinking about doing a diversity conference, uh, and they had picked the date, and so it was being put in my hands to to pull the diversity conference together. Well, I stated that I started in August. The diversity conference was the first week of October. Yes. Uh, so I had to, you know, there was no no honeymoon period. I had to hit the ground running and pull together uh what was a diversity conference uh, for our entire campus and community uh, because most of our events are open to the community as well. So we were able to pull that off. uh, And most people had told me about the president that anytime you do something for the first time, expect that she's going to criticize what you do because that's just her style. That's what I was told. Uh, So to just expect no matter what you do, understand that she's going to criticize some aspect of that work. So we pulled it off. Um, the conference went great. It was sold completely sold out. Um, no one expected that, but we had standing, you know, we were sold out and we had a waiting list of about a hundred people who wanted to participate in the conference. The president pulled me aside in the midst of the conference and, you know, wanted to bring me outside and have a conversation with me. And I'm already in my head thinking, well, I've already been preparing, you know, that she's going to give me some feedback, which is fine. I mean, you expect you're new, you're going to get feedback. So she brought me back outside and she said, you know, I just wanted to, you know, for us to kind of process a little bit on what's going on and what's happened and what I've seen thus far as it relates to the conference. I said, okay, fine. Uh, she said, is that to me? I just wanted you to know that I'm, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised that you were able to completely pull it off the way that you did. And, you know, I'm appreciative of what you bring to the table and what you're going to bring to the institution. So, I'm, you know, I'm waiting for the, the other shoe. I'm like, okay, and so that's the good part. Then you got to get the bad. But she didn't. Uh, there wasn't a bad part, and that was what she left me with. So I use that as an example to say to people, don't let other people put into your head what expectations you will have. Uh, and so be mindful of, of that. And so for me, that was a proud accomplishment. And thus far, we've had two uh, conferences. Both have all been sold out completely uh, in my time there. And we're working on our third. The second thing uh, I probably would say is the fact that when I walked into my current institution, uh, the, the well, I'm the chief, I'm the inaugural chief diversity officer for my campus. 
And so there were a lot of places that, you know, my role didn't exist. Uh, one of those places was in hiring and HR. Uh, so it's been a labor of love for the last two years, but I think it's finally taken place now where I review all job descriptions uh, before they are released to the public to ensure that they include language uh, that is of diversity, equity, and inclusion minded. Um, I also review all of the people that are being considered for first round interviews. And I have access to looking at all of the candidates to look to see whether they were diverse candidates in the pool that were not pulled into the initial first round. And I can send that back to the committee for consideration and review. Uh, so again, considering the fact that I have not been at the institution for two years yet, to have been able to make that kind of progress in an area of culture that usually is very, you know, tightly held, um, I think is for me an accomplishment uh, that I'm very proud of in the work that I've been able to do thus far at my institution. So I got them both in. <laughs> You did. I think, I just think that's very inspiring. I love the work that you do. Thank you so much for really taking the time to talk to me, to talk to our students. Uh, I truly appreciate it. No problem. And, you know, I'm signed up uh, with Fleischman uh, to be a mentor. Uh, I have not been paired uh, as of yet uh, with anyone, but, you know, the door remains open uh, for me to do that. I do that just as a matter of course in my work. Uh, at MCC, I take on new, younger um, professionals, not necessarily just professionals of color, but certainly professionals of color. And I try to mention them because I know for me that that was such an important part of, of my development that I, I can't know that and not put forth that effort for anybody else. So, so check out Mentor Match, see if you can find him on there. Um, <laughs> Thanks for watching and I will see you on the next one.